Welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm Francesco Zurlo. I'm the, uh, a member of the Observatory of Design Thinking for Business of Polytechnic Milano. I'm a full professor of industrial design here in the School of Design in Politecnico. And so I'm very glad to facilitate this interesting conversation about the challenges and perspective of design thinking. So, uh, you know, design thinking uh, has many and sometimes controversial interpretation and if we, we want to refer to the roots of design thinking, uh, we can mention some of these interpretation. Uh, for instance, the idea of reflective practice according with the American philosopher Donald Schoen, or a problem solving activities um, related to uh, the, the thought of Albert Simon, or uh, we can uh, uh, you know, mention the integrative thinking coming from the former Dean of the Rotman School of Management, Roger Martin, or maybe we can refer to uh, our scholar, uh, Roberto Verganti, a way to discover adding uh, meanings uh, for and to technologies. Or maybe we can, we can use another uh, interpretation coming from our guest, Jim Ditka, about uh, the idea of uh, the same thing as a social technology for innovation. So uh, this, uh, this conversation today, this is a debate, a conversation with our guests. This is the attempt to, let's say, put the design thinking in practice, you know? So actually design thinking is often a conversation, uh, is a dialectic conversation. So here we can compare opinions and experiences following um, a set of dichotomies. Uh, so a comparison, not exclusive dichotomies, of course. So this is a comparison between a scholar and a, a reflective practitioner, Jean and Carlo. Uh, between management, business, and architecture, between uh, micro, the scale of individuals and organizations, uh, and macro, so the city. The city today is the main subject of many design activities. Between, let me say, even Anglo-Saxon cultural approach and the Mediterranean approach, even if uh, Carlo crosses uh, uh, the two cultures, and so on. This is a way to highlight, let's say, the contemporary challenges faced by design thinking. So let me introduce uh, our eminent guest. So um, I'm very glad to introduce Jean Vietka. Uh, she's a United Technologies Professor of Business Administration at Darden Graduate School of Business at the University of Virginia. And she's a reference scholar for many of us about the relationship between design and strategic thinking. So good morning, Jean. And then, Good morning. then we have our second guest. Uh, he's a very famous architect, and I appreciate a lot his work, Carlo Ratti. Carlo Ratti is the director of the MIT Sensible City Lab and founding partner at Carlo Ratti Associate. So, good afternoon, Carlo, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning again. Good morning or good afternoon to all of you. And by the way, I, I want to say to Virginia, we are sharing something interesting. That also my title at MIT is Professor of Urban Technology. So I think, you know, we got uh, this additional common ground uh, between us. So thank you so much, Carlo. So we have almost half an hour for our conversation. And so and, uh, we, we have very strict controllers uh, to respect the schedule. So, dear guest, I ask since now to forgive me if I interrupt you uh, to respect this uh, very tight schedule. And, you know, um, it's time for uh, the first question. This is a nice breaking question. And uh, once again, let's start with a, with a dichotomy. But I want to use a couple of stuff. This one is the first stuff. This is a, a magic one. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Harry Potters. This is a reproduction of the, the magic, magic wand of Harry Potter. So you can say Wingardium Leviosa. Do you remember? Maybe have, have you seen <laughs> the movies? And yeah. uh, then you can, uh, you know, you can transform everything in something very successful, innovative. No? So, and this is a way to make things happen. No? So to transform products and services to to make them best sellers. No? So, and this is a positive disposition about design thinking. Let me say magic, question mark. So we can discuss maybe later. And I have another stuff. 
this is a this little box is a, an almost perfect reproduction of a masterpiece made by uh, a conceptual Italian artist, Piero Manzoni, in 1961. The Italian name is Merda d'Artista, artist shit. Or, you know, you can find almost uh, 30 grams of uh, artist shit in this little box. And this is the negative disposition uh, to design thinking. Um, you know, let me say, when you use it uh, as a one-shot activity uh, for, for innovation within the organization, no? and then, as some scholars say, uh, design thinking is similar to, uh, please forgive me, a bullshit. And then, uh, so, what is the truth? No? So um, we, we need to find something in between, not these two polarities, these two opposite feelings. And you know, Eitor Robit, uh, this is uh, the memory of my classical study, Catullo, the Latin poet. No? So he brought a very interesting poem, Odi et Amo. So hate or love it. And I would have write, written this quote instead of hate or love it. But you know, uh, I think it's very interesting, this poem, because you need to consider both the sides of the same coin. So they are interlinked, this idea of hating or loving, no? a specific uh, argument, a specific issue, in this case, even the design thinking approach. So let me start with Jean. Uh, with, this, uh, with this question, what, what do you think about reasons and factors that lead us on these opposite feelings? Uh, Jean, you have two minutes, let's say, almost five or six tweeters, and also to discuss with us about this idea. So, uh, the, the floor is yours, please. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Francesco. Well, my grandsons are great Harry Potter fans. So I have to uh, spend most of my time trying to help organizations understand how magical design thinking can be. Truly revolutionary in bringing a whole new set of tools to help us with a world that is increasingly uncertain and unpredictable. Um, I also love the way it helps us to talk across difference, to look for higher order solutions out of a diverse conversation. And finally, at a really personal level, I love the way it's allowed accountants like me to find our own creativity. So motivating. On the other hand, I think of most of the problems with design thinking as being less with it and more with our misuse of it. Um, I particularly hate the one day hackathon uh, phenomena where we think spending one day with post-it notes is all people need to become a design thinker. Um, I really worry about the way we are bastardizing basic design principles like experiment and using the need for experimentation as an excuse for sloppy thinking or for lack of foresight, right, when it's not. Um, and then finally, I don't hate, but I worry about some of the ethical issues because we know the power of design can be harnessed for good or for evil. We can just as easily manipulate people with design as engage them. And so that's where I uh, still come out very much on the love scale, but worried about some of what we see today around the misuse of design. OK, so thank you so much, Jean. And uh, now it's uh, the time of Carlo. So Carlo, please, what do you think about reasons and factors about these uh, uh, opposite feelings? Yeah, well, uh, you know, just, you know, I, I quite agree with what Jeannie said, and I'd like to go back to what you mentioned. You mentioned Catullus, where Catullus was saying not love it or hate it, but he was saying love it and hate it, so all the eight times. So I do both things at the same time. So let me tell you, you know, what I like is exactly what Jeannie was saying, is that, you know, it's a good methodology in order to look at complex problems where there's not just one single variable to optimize, there's many variables, and in this kind of complex optimization uh, landscape, in this kind of looking at these kind of wicked problems, then you know design thinking can help us a lot. So that's a that's the positive side. That's why I, I love it. At the same time, I'll tell you why I I hate it, and it's, it's similar to what Jeannie was saying. But uh, um, it is the following: when you think about design, 
you mentioned before Herbert Simon. Herbert Simon, uh, you know, was a great researcher, Nobel Prize winner, uh, mathematician, economist in the past century. And he wrote a beautiful book called The Sciences of the Artificial. And what Herbert Simon says, he says, you know, the natural sciences look at how the world is, but design looks at how the world could be. So design really has this tension towards the future, toward transforming the present into different potential futures. And sometimes, you know, design thinking forgets that, the ultimate goal, and it's used more like this kind of, uh, more like, you know, a, 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 a shallower way to look at problems, but by missing the kind of the ultimate goal, which is what applies to cities, to buildings, to organizations, is about, you know, inventing how a certain condition could be tomorrow. How can we turn the present into the, into the future? So again, you know, I feel that sometimes, you know, the, the methodology is not used in order to tackle such profound questions like Herbert Simon says, but is used more in a shallow way to come together and, you know, justify also some less rigorous thinking. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you so much. I agree with you and with Gina uh, for this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this answer. Uh, let's go with, the, with, with another question. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to mention this sentence coming from Thomas Jefferson. Architecture is my delight and putting up and pulling down one of my favorite amusement. And, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the Uni United States. Uh, he was the author of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, uh, let me say an enigmatic person because so he was a politician, eclectic one. No? So he was a politician, a scientist, an inventor, a farmer, farmer, a slaveholder, and even an architect. Uh, so reading your paper, uh, Jean, I discovered that he designed not only the University of Virginia, but not not just the hardware, but let me say even the software. No? So the way to how to organize the life of the students in that uh, that campus. So uh, let's go to the question. Uh, you know, we want to refer to the new European Bauhaus. Uh, this is a new movement uh, uh, coming from uh, European community. And this, this movement uh, is intended to be a bridge between uh, the world of science and technology and the world of art and culture. It refers uh, to the Bauhaus movement uh, coming from 1999 uh, in uh, 1919 uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, thanks uh, to a founder with a vision like Walter Gropius uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a way to put together different disciplines you know, to explore new possibilities for modernity. And so uh, a way to modernize uh, uh, the, the artifacts, uh, the cities, the buildings around us. So and interpreting architecture as, as the summa the summa of all the human expressions. So how do you interpret the relationship between architecture, design, and strategy? Mm -hmm. So I, your, uh, your slides, and let's, let's, uh, let's start with the planimetry of the University of Virginia. Virginia, wonderful. Well, thank you, Francesco. Yes, um, I discovered the power of design through architecture. Uh, I'm a very narrowly trained business person in many ways, um, and in trying to teach strategic planning to managers, I really struggled with exactly the point that Carlo raised earlier. How do we help them understand that the act of creating strategy is not about filling out paperwork? It's about creating some image of the future so vividly that we can live into it. Well, when I became a faculty member at the University of Virginia and I entered Thomas Jefferson's very famous grounds, as we call them, for me, it captured in physical form the power of design. So uh, this is our university today, uh, uh, a thriving community based on, as you will probably notice, Jefferson was a huge uh, fan of uh, Palladio. So uh, most of our main campus that he designed in the 1820s is a replica of some building of Palladios that he discovered in his Italian travels. Um, but what people tend to focus on uh, when they see these beautiful grounds is the physical structure. But what has fascinated me as I have gotten to know Jefferson's purpose and philosophy is that the physical structure 
the physical architecture we're looking at, uh, the hardware, as you described it, Francesco, just scratches the surface of why this is so important. It's in the background, in the software, in the way Jefferson designed things like student self-governance processes and honor codes, and in which he brought together the physical architecture of what he called the academical village, combined with a purpose that in order to prepare citizens for a democracy, faculty and students should live together and instead of a hierarchy, work together in a community of learning. And you can see that community of learning that Jefferson designed is as alive and vibrant today, 200 years later, as it was when he designed it, I think because of the power of design and his principles. So when you ask me, what does strategy, how does strategy and architecture and design work together? For me, as I take executives to our lawn, and walk around with an architectural historian who explains Jefferson's philosophy and why it looks like it does and what's behind the scenes, what we realize is that architecture for me is the most powerful metaphor for the process of strategy. And strategy is fundamentally a design process, of course. It, it, it does exactly what Herb Simon talked about and, and Carlo referenced. It allows us, having told the truth about the current reality, to then together design a future in kind of a virtual world and then behaviorally experiment our way to making that strategy real. And so for me, these concepts of architecture and design and strategy, they're all part of the same conversation. Jefferson and architects use bricks and mortar as business strategists, we use values and culture and processes and systems, but we share the aim of working together to create an environment which encourages the behaviors that we hope that people will exhibit. And so for me, the three are really inseparable. Okay, thank you so much. Very, very interesting, your, uh, uh, your way of interpreting architecture related to uh, strategy. Uh, and I think it's a very, uh, you know, powerful and generative metaphor, I think, for uh, interpreting strategy today, facing complexity and so on. So mm -hmm. let's go on with um, the first question after the ice breaking uh, to Carlo Ratti. And uh, let's start with a sentence of Marco Zanuso. Marco Zanuso is a pillar of Politecnico di Milano uh, for architecture and design always facing and looking for uh, the increasing complexity of his contemporary world. He worked for companies, uh, you know, as uh, IBM and Olivetti designing architecture and iconic artifacts, integrating at different scales, micro and macro design issues with an idea of synergy among technological and symbolic components of a project linking them in a, an expressive unity. And uh, we have a quote uh, uh, coming from Marco Zanuso uh, and quoting a methodology of Marco Zanuso, Synergetica. And this is the capability to combine technical elements able to synergically work in order to provide advanced features. Um, Carlo, I'm not an architecture critic. I study architecture, but I'm not an architecture critic, but I see you as, let's, let me say, maybe one of the main important followers of the work of Marco Zanuso. So my question for you is, is the following. How do you push and implement the synergetic concept proposed by Marco Zanuso in your mm -hmm. design projects? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the question. First of all, I want to say I'm a great fan of Marco Zanuso. And, and his idea of synergetics is also what, uh, you know, many other people at his time were developing. Think about Bucky Fuller. Bucky Fuller was a great proponent of synergetics. And my understanding, you know, I'm not a critic, but my understanding is that, you know, a lot of that was part of the same way of thinking. And basically thinking about how we can put together systems and under, uh, understand complex systems, not by looking at individual parts, but by always taking a holistic view. And uh, let me tell you how that turns into methodology in what we do. And when I say what we do, I mean what we do at MIT, at the Sensible City Lab, at MIT in Cambridge, but also with a small base in Singapore. So there, that's where we do the research 
about cities, and then also with our design office in New York, in Italy, in, uh, in London. Uh, and so I, I, I try to look at the key components. The first one, you know, when you want to look at things in a, with, with synergetics, uh, a design from that angle, then you also need different people being able to look at all the different aspects of whatever you, you are designing. So the first thing is that design, as we thought design in the 20th century, this kind of one single designer making decisions for millions of people, well, that's over. It's really much more about collaboration, different people, team working and coming together and so on. So that's number one. The second thing um, is uh, that in doing this, you also want really transdisciplinarity. And one of the most beautiful things is how, you know, we have uh, people coming from design and architecture working together with physicists and complex scientists and also at the same time with economists or social scientists. So somehow you really want to have different angles, not only different people looking at the problem, but people coming from different angles, different vectors and, uh, and working together. That's not that easy. So the first thing, you know, that you need to do is start creating a common language, sometimes because disciplines have evolved in the past in silos. We have that, you know, we're using language in a very different way. So people need to understand each other. And that's probably the first important thing that people joining our lab or our studio need to do is really be able to develop this kind of common language to collaborate with people coming from very different uh, directions. And that's quite interesting. You know, sometimes also people have different goals, you know, people from complex science, they want to publish in nature or science. People from design, they want to exhibit at MoMA. Uh, the social scientists want to have alt other metric of success. And you kind of blur all of that and you need to give them a way to, to understand each other and to, to find goals that all of them can share. Uh, and then there's a third component. The third component was a bit inspired, I, I, the way I'll frame it now was a bit inspired of what to mention before about with the Manzoni uh, piece of art, you know, what you said with the bullshit. And, uh, and I wanted to refer to, um, uh, to the following. And um, so today, the internet is actually multiplying the number of uh, potential ways to look at a problem. We can look at many solutions which are generated all over the world. So somehow there's a very good thing in the past, that creative process, the beginning of the creative process, which is exploring the realm of possibilities is much easier just because we can use and leverage networks in order to be exposed to all of this. As a matter of fact, every day, just when we turn on our, our laptops, we are bombarded by many different possible creative uh, solutions that we could apply. So what becomes more and more important is to be able to tell a good idea from a bad idea. And that's what we try to teach our people at, uh, at MIT. And the reason I say the bullshit thing is that uh, famously, Ernest Hemingway described this in an interview with Vanity Fair, if I'm not wrong, at the end of his life. He described this process like the bullshit detector. And so basically what is more and more important today, I believe, in this condition is, again, to summarize, put together many people, people from different disciplines. But then because we are exposed to so many different possible solutions, is actually being able to tell what is good and what is bad, Be having developing and strengthening our own individual bullshit detectors. And, and I think, you know, that's what we try to teach uh, uh, people at, uh, at MIT, you know, to really develop this ability to, uh, to, 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 to uh, compare different solutions. That's also what is more and more important in our, in our design, design office. So just to summarize those three kind of components is what I, I, I would mention based on how we work, both in academic and in research and in design. So oh, th thank you so much. Very, very inspiring your uh, thought about uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this idea of synergetica. Uh, so uh, let's go on with the, uh, the second question uh, for uh, Jim Yetka. Um, you know, uh, let me say that we suffer a lot today of what I call the toolism, toolism syndrome. Uh, too much tools, too many tools. And you know, a continuous search for uh, not the latest one. Uh, that, let me say there is another syndrome, the latestism. No? Mm -hmm. So toolism and latestism. I think that in English they they don't work, but you know the idea is quite clear. No? So yes. And from from my point point of view, the toolism is the 
the wrong avenue to create awareness and a culture about the power of creativity and design thinking within the organizations. As deeply described in your recent book, uh, uh, experiencing design, design thinking can represent a cultural component of the organization. So what are the design principle, uh, principles and experiences that allow to create the appropriate design culture? Well, um, we've been teaching design thinking to managers and scientists and physicians and, 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 and folks like that at, at Darden for about 12 years now and following their learning journey with this idea, Francesco, of doing exactly what you're saying, trying to understand the kind of experiences they need to do design well. And I think we're at the stage with the popularity of design thinking where we need to raise the bar, as we would say in the US, and, and talk about the difference between what it means to do design thinking superficially and what it, we need to do to do it well, right? And, and so for us, uh, what we see is that the doing of design thinking, the using the tools that you mentioned, um, really is just a provocation for the creation of an experience, a deeper experience, not for the person we're designing for, as we know well, but really for the person who is using design themselves, the innovator themselves. And that innovator's journey, if it is not deep, if their experience is not deep, then we'll never achieve the transformational impact that design thinking can have. And so as we've looked at the journey, we can look at the traditional design thinking journey, we normally talk about it, and our activities. So we gather data, we identify insights, we um, establish design criteria or how might we questions, and then we generate ideas, we prototype, we experiment. Behind each of those activities though, there is an experience that needs to be created for the innovator themselves in order for these changes to take. I mean, in some ways, we believe design thinking has to change the user before it changes those we're designing it for. Right? So for instance, we gather data. If immersion doesn't occur, then we don't make that shift to a true design mindset. So we all know that you can go out and do a few ethnographic interviews, but do them badly. Listen through our own biases, listen through already existing solutions. Immersion and achieving the experience of immersion means truly stepping into the lived experience of another. That stepping in shifts the perspective. And we begin to talk about things like the development of empathy, the introduction of emotion into the conversation. Innovators become caring. Right? They want to change. They are motivated to change the situation for those they are designing for. And I won't trace that through each of the different phases, but we see it happening in each one. Uh, for instance, just as another example, idea generation. I mean, you know, we all think of idea generation as being about brainstorming or, or so many superficial aspects of design think about idea generation as brainstorming. But what really matters for truly transformational ideas that create new futures is creating the conditions for the emergence of what I think of as higher order solutions. Solutions that are not compromises, that don't accept trade-offs. Solutions that take the diversity in the room across a group of stakeholders and help them to see together what no one of them could possibly see alone, right? That's a far cry from just setting up a brainstorming and give every, giving everyone some post-its. So, our argument has been we have to understand at each phase the kind of supportive infrastructure and principles and environment that these learners need to truly embrace what design is capable of. So, for instance, in the immersion phase, um, not only do we have to encourage sharing, but we have to make conversations about emotions, which usually don't happen in business, feel normal and feel valuable. Um, for instance, in generating ideas, we need to push back on compromise. We need to invite people to bring their authentic selves and all of their difference into the conversation 
then make that conversation safe for them to do that by surrounding them with the design tools that bring order to the kind of chaos of that kind of diversity. Um, in experimentation, we need to create an environment that insists on seeing data from the results of experiments and that accepts we're not perfect and that we won't come up with the right answer. So for us, this whole notion of doing design well means deeply understanding the experience of the designer themselves and bringing a new way of thinking and behaving into the organizations that they inhabit. Um, for, for truly trained designers, I think there is an inner confidence that allows them often to operate despite a supportive environment. But from everything we've seen, if we want non-designers in business organizations to really begin using design thinking in ways that achieve its potential, this kind of support is absolutely essential. Okay, thank you so much. Very, very interesting. So, this, uh, so you, you touch many, many aspects you know, so of the integration of design thinking within the organization. Maybe we, if we have time later on, we, we can discuss uh, a, little, a little bit in, in depth this. So mm -hmm. let, let's go with the, the last question to Carlo Ratti. The time is going to, to be over. And, uh, you know, um, I want to refer to another designer. In this case, if this is a, an American designer, Harry Dreyfus. Dreyfus may be one, one, one of the first designers uh, invited the, in the business arena. So he, he holds some uh, uh, seminars uh, and some conferences in Arba Business School in the early 50s, in the early 50s, uh, not suspected time, not so for, uh, for the role of design of, uh, as a strategic asset uh, for, uh, for companies and organizations. And he was used to say that diplomacy is uh, particularly relevant for designers. Uh, in other words, uh, let me say interdisciplinary collaboration and participation and inclusion are fundamental in design projects. So you already mentioned this in the, the previous uh, answer, but uh, from uh, your point of view, what are the barriers to overcome uh, to pursue the design at large vision that connotes your design projects? Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll be I'll be very quick because I understand we are running a bit uh, out of time. Um, I'll tell you one thing which uh, usually kills a lot of all we've been discussing today, and that's when people talk about discuss and talk about best practices. So when you talk about the best practice, it means you're looking at the past, you're looking at the solution that's been tested, that has been proven to work in some some different context, and you're just taking that. And you know, somehow locking the future into the past because you're taking the solution and bringing it into a new problem, a new context, and you know, basically bringing it into the future. And and I think you know, a lot of the things that happens, for instance, in cities are based on best practices. If you think about a lot of the RFPs done by municipalities are based on best practices. They ask, you know, how many times did you do this? Was it successful? Then we do it again. But that is really the opposite of design when you look at the definition of design that we mentioned before about you know inventing new possible conditions being creative innovative finding new solutions not just replicating solutions from from the past and and so i think it's something we should all work on because you know best practices are really something that you know all consulting firms you know in their report they start from best practices but also the procurement as i was saying mostly in the public space, but also in the private space, is based on best practices. You know, they will tell you how many times have you done this in the past, was it successful, great, do it once more. And that's really not a way to, to innovate. So we kind of need to get rid of this approach uh, and get rid of all what it entails in terms of, um, you know, procurement and uh, in processes, uh, so that we can be more innovative in our companies, in our cities, in general, for what concerns us, which was your question, in the way we approach the built environment. Okay, thank you so much, even for your uh, short answer. And you know, uh, time for wrap up. Uh, wrap up is, I think, uh, uh, not sufficient to go in depth in what you you said in the, the previous uh, um, uh, responding to the previous uh, questions. Uh, just some keywords. Uh, so. 
you know, avoiding to have a kind of uh, uh, one shot approach for design thinking within the organization. So creating a design culture. Uh, you, Carlo, mentioned this idea of design as a, a natural tension toward the future. So always stress in this natural tension toward the future. Uh, the idea of architecture as a, a generative and powerful metaphor for, uh, for a strategist and for business people, uh, the possibility to use the design thinking approach in order to face complexity and complex problems, ill-defined problems that characterize today the, uh, the uh, traditional uh, activities of, of managers. And then a global and holistic view characterized by the design thinking approach, transdisciplinarity, or maybe you know that in MIT, uh, where you teach us and uh, you have the uh, MIT Media Lab, so they, they stress the idea of anti-disciplinarity. So we, we, we go over this, the idea of transdisciplinarity because, you know, disciplines sometimes they are uh, cages and also on, and uh, the pre-built uh, uh, situation where uh, that, that we use to, to make sense of the real of the real world. And, and you stress, uh, Carlo, this idea of uh, community of scope, uh, or let me say maybe community of practice, so the same coming from the uh, Lidka uh, work, this idea of purposeful, uh, purposeful space. Uh, and then uh, I, I appreciated a lot this idea to be exposed to a network, and also quoting even Anyway, you know, to be, become a detector of weak signals uh, and so understanding how communities are changing, technologies changing, the way people behave, the, the, the habits of people and so on. And then the importance of empathy, uh, the idea of step in and the user uh, mind and a, a very interesting keyword for business. So, so this is very usual for, for designers, considering emotions, mm -hmm. considering emotion and uh, the importance of the diversity. Uh, once again, this idea of invention, new solutions. So not molding a uh, solution uh, within, uh, as I mentioned before, pre-built situation. So thank you so much for this first round. We will have another round later on. Uh, we'll ask um, me any anything session. So um, let me thank again for your availability, for very dense, uh, 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 notes, uh, comments, and tips uh, uh, following this conversation. So now it's time to to step up to uh, the other session, and then I leave the the floor uh, to Cabidio Cautela. Thank you so much. Uh, this you, is a you. you know a, a magic wand for you, and so design <laughs> is magic. Uh, I'm quite sure about it. <laughs>